We're now going to consider an application of improper integrals, one that actually has some real meaning when you look at some of the modern uh, space technology that's being used, all the Dragon and the, uh, uh, the real revolution in rocket science that's going on these days. We're going to look at how gravitation and infinite integrals can lead us to a simple concept called the uh, escape velocity, or how fast you have to be moving at the surface of the Earth to have enough energy to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. We're going to go right back to Newtonian physics here. The force exerted by two objects on each other through gravity is given by the, the gravitational constant, the mass of the first object, mass of the second object, and the distance between them squared. And this gravitational constant is quite tiny, 10 to the minus 10, at least in the standard units we use. And we're going to work through that to imagine what it would take to lift an object off the surface of the Earth and out of its gravitational pull. As soon as we say out of the pull, that means taking it out towards effectively infinity away from the Earth. That's the easiest way to define it because there's no sharp boundary where we can say, oh, now you're outside the field of the Earth. Well, you're always being attracted a little bit. The corollary to that when you want to represent the distance you need to travel to escape would be to say we want to travel out to infinity. And that makes sense if we can find a finite amount of energy that does that exact job of getting you out to infinity. Let's see how that works. If we're talking about energy, and we're talking about lifting off the surface of the Earth, the most straightforward way to arrive at that amount of energy is to think of the work you have to do. If you lift a book from the table up a foot or up half a meter for the metric folks, then that takes work, and the work can be calculated as the force times the distance. Now that's great if your distance from the center of the Earth, that's what our knot here is, if that's constant. It gets a little problematic when you don't lift it by one meter, but you go on the scale of, this, of the Earth and you're lifting it up you know, from the surface out to five diameters or 100 diameters. There, the radius is changing quite dramatically as you move away. So what do we do in that kind of case? Well, let's imagine breaking that whole lifting pattern up into very small intervals. Why would we do that? Because if we lift it just a little bit, then the radius or the distance from the center of the Earth to where we are and where we end up is going to be roughly constant. So there's going to be an R and a delta R going on in this particular analysis. This will be our work to lift up a small amount with delta D being, or sorry, D being a small change in distance from the center, and then we're going to be able to use these calculations here, the GM1 and 2 divided by R squared as the amount of energy required to lift us up one little bit, and then we're going to lift another little bit, and another little bit, and we're going to do that total, compute that total using an integral. Let's see how that works. Okay, so if we want to talk about the work to lift delta r, lift by delta r distance, that's going to be g m1 m2 over r squared delta r. And we've done so many of these at this point, I think we can all agree that the total work to lift outside of the gravitational field is going to equal exactly that formula, gm1m2 over r squared, dr now, instead of delta r, and it's going to be an integral. Okay, what are the limits of integration? Well, we have a certain radius, that's the surface of the Earth, that's where we're going to start. So our initial distance is going to be r naught, and then we want to lift it all the way out towards, well, as far as we can get, and that's where we very naturally in this scenario end up with an infinite limit of integration or an improper integral. It's completely reasonable in this context. We want to lift it as far away as possible, well that would be an infinite distance. And that's it. That's our integral. So we can actually evaluate that pretty easily if you keep in mind that these are all constants. The gravitational weight constant is constant, and the mass of the Earth, hopefully pretty constant, and the mass of what we're lifting also constant. 
So what we can do is move all of those outside the integral and what we get next is literally r to the minus 2 dr. Ah, wait, we've seen that the integral to infinity of 1 over t squared is going to be finite, so this will also be finite. We know in advance, and now we're just going to find the actual value. Can't cheat. We have an infinity in there. We better be careful about it. We're going to make the limit as b goes to infinity, gm1, m2, r naught to b, r to the minus 2 dr. So we're going to take a limit of what we had before. Everything's identical. We're just breaking down this upper limit of infinity into two pieces, a fixed finite value, but then pushing that finite value out towards infinity. And if we evaluate this, we need to keep the limit as b goes to infinity, gm1, m2. So this is a more traditional physics real kind of model. Uh, there's more constants running around as a result, which doesn't make everyone happy, but there it is. Between b and r0. And again, r0 is equal to the radius of the Earth. That's where we would start our slices when we start lifting our object a little bit off the surface and out towards space. All right, we do that, and then let's, now we can finish it off here. Let's do it as the limit, as b goes to infinity, gm1, m2, and what we're going to get here is negative 1 over b minus, oh, it's going to be hard to squeeze in, negative 1 over r naught. Okay. And last but not least, oh, thank goodness, as b gets larger and larger, whereas b is in the denominator, 1 over larger and larger and larger and larger number, this heads towards 0. So at the end of the day, this term vanishes, and we end up with negative, negative is positive, oh, goodness, uh, equals g m1 m2 over r naught. There we go. Okay. So that is the integral value once we ask how much energy does it take to lift an object off the surface of the Earth out to infinity. It'll involve the masses, not a big surprise, the gravitational constant, and the surface of the Earth radius. Let's actually go and calculate some values here and see if they make any sense at all to us. All right, let's actually evaluate this in the context of the values of a person being lifted off the surface of the Earth, the Earth being substantially heavier than any person, and the constants in play. So the energy or work, requ work required would be, as we found out, actually let's write it in the two ways. It's the integral from the surface out to infinity of the force times the amount we're lifting by, and we found that to be g m1 m2 over r naught. That's all we needed. And now if we use these values here, we can actually compute a real and final numeric value for this. And it ends up being roughly 4.4 times 10 to the 9 joules. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Who cares, right? If we get 4.4 times 10 to the 9 joules, how much is that? Well, it turns out another way to look at this is to ask, how can we trade that energy for something else? And we'll take a look at that next. If we're interested in computing something that should apply to any object, one of the ways we can think about this is trading off kinetic energy, or energy from movement, to the energy that we just found. The kinetic energy in an object is one half mv squared. So if we talk about maybe pedaling a bicycle or driving a car or doing something and moving fast enough, that'll give us a certain amount of kinetic energy. And we're interested in setting that kinetic energy, one half, let's call it m1, which is the mass of us, v squared, equal to the g m1 m2 over r naught, which is the energy required to escape the Earth. 
and see what can we can do with this. Well, we found this was 4.4 .4 times 10 to the 9, and we have a half. We said our mass was 70. And so the velocity we would need, if we were to be moving at a certain velocity and be able to trade all that for, connect, uh, for potential energy going off into space or the work required to lift, lift us off the face of the Earth, we'd have 4.4 .4 times 10 to the 9 times 2, bring the half across, divide by 70. And if you do that calculation, not too surprisingly, we get about roughly root 8 here, which is 4. So we're going to end up with, as it turns out, about 11,200. And the units here, based on all the other things we used, would be meters per second. Okay, this is a real number that we might get some intuition about. This is the number or the velocity at which we'd have to be moving, as we say go around the Earth or something, to have enough energy to then shoot off and escape the gravitational pull of the Earth completely. This is 11 kilometers per second. <laughs> Most of us don't pedal our bicycles that fast, so that movie scene with E.T., there was something else going on there. So this is incredibly, incredibly fast, and it's why when you look at rocket launches, they don't actually move this fast and then escape. They actually build up the velocity as they go higher and higher, and so actually they don't have this velocity at any point. What they do is they have lower velocities at all the time, but they keep adding energy through the rocket thrusters as they move higher and higher and further out of the gravitational well. So it works out pretty well. Uh, it just tells us that we're not going to be able to just run really fast and then escape the planet's gravity well, even if we try really, really hard.